hello lovelies in this video tim is going to be looking at the definition of abnormality for your a level psychology now in here there are lots of facts and people and studies and dates that you need to be able to remember for your exam to help you remember all of those things over on my website there is a massive course with lots and lots of questions to help you remember everything <laughs> at mental illness and psychopathology, we need to be able to define the term abnormal. One way of defining abnormality is as a deviation from accepted social norms. As we've already seen when we looked at social influence, every society has sets of accepted and usually followed rules, rules of behaviour, rules of dress, etc. These are social norms. Most people conform to these rules most of the time. Most of us act within these sets of social norms. Deviating from them can be considered to be abnormal. It's a marker of abnormality. This definition isn't universal. It doesn't always work. These norms, social rules, are both specific to culture and they're specific to time, and they vary with both of those. A major issue with this definition is its consequences, which can be dire indeed. Successive regimes over many years have used trumped-up charges of abnormality as an excuse for persecu persecution and discrimination. To take one example, through the 1950s, the ruling communist regime of the USSR defined anyone who disagreed or opposed the government as abnormal and mentally ill. Many of these were placed in brutal asylums from which they were never released. A second issue with this definition of abnormality as a deviation from accepted social norms is that those social norms change over time, sometimes quite drastically. To take one example in the UK, for many years, up until about 1974 in fact, homosexuality was thought to be abnormal. It was therefore defined as mental illness and this led to discrimination and persecution for many years and for many people. Even today, many people consider transgender people to be abnormal. This leads to persecution, discrimination, and even high suicide rates. Another way of defining abnormality is mathematical or numerical. This uses a bell curve, sometimes also known as a standard distribution, an example of which you can see here. The x-axis running horizontally on this graph represents a property or a statistic such as height or weight, something which is continuous and can be numerically measured. When we say continuous data, that means data which increases along a set scale, like height, which increases in centimetres, or weight, which increases in kilograms. It doesn't work for what we call discrete data, things in discrete separate categories, like eye colour, which is blue or brown or grey, or hair colour, which is blonde or brown or black. They can't be put on a continuous scale and thus can't be represented on this standard distribution. The y-axis on this curve, running vertically from top to bottom, represents frequency. How often this value is seen, how much of it there is. On this standard distribution, therefore, the most common, most frequent, most often seen behaviour or property is towards the middle, such as middling height or middling weight, around the average. There's more people who have middling height or middling weight, so the curve is higher at that middling point. Those on the outside to either extreme, at the left, so very low height or very low weight, or to the right, so very high weight or very high height, are less common, so the curve there is much lower. To illustrate this further, and put this standard distribution into some kind of context, let's look at two examples. The first example is height, which you can see an example of here with this graph. Most people fall within a relatively small range of heights, between about 160 and 180 centimetres, about 5 foot 2 and 6 foot-ish. These represent the peak on the bell curve. This property is held most frequently, it's held by most people. Nearly everybody falls within those two limits. People below or people above this rather narrow range of heights are actually quite rare. Four, five, six percent of the population. These are the less common extremes. They're abnormally tall or abnormally short, so they fall to the far left or far right of the bell curve. The curve there is much lower because there are so few of them. A second example, and one that we've already seen to an extent, is in memory and recall. As we've already seen, most people have a limited ability to recall lists of words. The short-term memory capacity is usually about seven items, give or take a couple. So we get a range of maybe five through to nine. However, there are people at either extreme. 
Some people are able to recall many more words, 11, 12, 15, even more. Some people are only able to record a very small number of words, two or three or four, for example. These are the extremes on this normal distribution. They fall at the far left or far right because they represent a very small number of people. The majority in the middle around the average is much more frequent. There's many more of them. And so the curve there is much higher. For nearly any type of continuous data involving humanity, if you plot it as a graph, you tend to end up with something representing a bell curve. Like weight, for example, looks very similar to height. As with any form of measurement or any description of abnormality, there are problems. As we've already seen, using normal distribution or a bell curve to define abnormality only works for continuous data. It doesn't work if that data is in separate discrete categories like hair colour or eye colour. It can't be applied to behaviour which splits into these discrete categories. Also, the normal distribution only tells us the frequency of a variable. It doesn't make any reference to the desirability of that behaviour. It just tells us how often it occurs, what percentage of the population fall into that bit of the continuous scale. Let's take an example. A statistically large amount of men in the UK suffer from depression. This shows up on the bell curve on the standard distribution as being frequent, but it's not desirable. There's also no distinction made between the harmlessly eccentric and the psychologically and mentally ill. Choosing to wear a bright green tie is against social norms, but it's also completely harmless, apart from possibly to fashion. Choosing to verbally abuse strangers is also against social norms, but that causes a great deal of harm. Another problem is that there is no set and defined cutoff point on that graph. There's no concrete point on the bell curve or standard distribution where normal behaviour becomes abnormal and against social norms. Where that line is, is a completely grey area, where opinions are split and different people will put that line in a different place. Everybody has a slightly different idea about what an abnormal height is or an abnormal weight. Some behaviours which are psychologically abnormal are statistically frequent, such as depression. Depression is a psychological illness, but it's also unfortunately very frequent. That's not information that we could gain from this normal or standard distribution graph. A third alternative definition of abnormality is failure to function normally. What this usually means is that you are unable to cope, process or deal with the demands of everyday life and work in our culture and time period. And obviously, there are a variety of criteria for this diagnosis. What does failure mean? What does function normally mean? These definitions obviously vary with culture and time period. And again, we come back to social norms. And these social norms of what functioning normally is change with every culture and change with every time period. But these are the criteria which are usually applied to this today. And meeting some or all of these criteria will usually label a patient as abnormal. They aren't able to function normally in everyday life and society. The first of these is one we've already looked at, dysfunctional behaviour. By dysfunctional behaviour, we mean behaviour which doesn't line up with and conform with accepted social norms. The second is observer discomfort. By this, we mean behaving in a way that makes others around you distressed or uncomfortable. A third is unpredictable behaviour, at least appearing to not be in control of your actions or behaviour. Your behaviour seems random and is unpredictable to those around you. A fourth is irrational behaviour. By that, we mean behaviour which has no logical or rational reason behind it. It seems to follow your own internal logic and is unreasoned and random, similar to unpredictable behaviour, but with a slightly different basis. And lastly, fifthly, personal distress, being affected and controlled by emotions to an unusual and extreme degree. Most of us are able to regulate how our behaviour is dependent on our emotions. Personal distress is when we lose that ability. As with any definition of abnormality, the idea of using failure to function as a definition has some problems. The first of these is that failure to function relies completely on accepted social norms and conventions. As we've already seen, these vary massively with culture, time period, the country you're in, your age and your gender. What would be considered completely normal in 21st century Britain today would be vastly considered a failure to function in 19th century Britain 200 years ago. There are always individual differences and behaviour always varies from individual to individual. Each of the criteria for diagnosis contains some grey area. To take an example, 
Who decides what is logical behaviour? Who decides what is rational behaviour? Everyone at some point has done behaviour which fits into one of those categories for diagnosis. At some point, we've all acted irrationally. We've all been affected to an undue extent by our emotions. Lastly, there is no consideration in this definition of the causes of this behaviour. It doesn't take into account, for example, alcohol or substance abuse, which might cause someone to act irrationally. It just takes that behaviour and uses it as a basis for diagnosis without ever considering outside causes. In 1958, a researcher called Jehoda laid out six conditions which were put forward as being essential to ideal mental health. They were, number one, positive self-attitude, having a positive image and regard for yourself, high self-image or high self-esteem are other ways to put this. Number two, self-actualization. This means being fulfilled as a person and realizing your potential, what you can do. Number three is resistance to stress, being resistant to the stresses of everyday life and work. Number four is personal autonomy. That's making your own decisions and being in control of your own life rather than having your decisions and life controlled by others or being completely dependent on luck. Number five is an accurate perception of reality. You see the world around you, the people involved with your life and the events, realistically and logically. Number six is adaptation, being able to adapt to your environment as it changes and change your behaviour to the conditions that you're placed in, rather than having completely consistent behaviour which doesn't vary as conditions around you change. Of course, each of these six conditions is subjective. It's not mathematical data. There's a grey area in each of them as to what constitutes stress, what constitutes adaptation, what do we mean by a positive self-image, how resistant do you need to be to stress to be resistant to stress. It can be extremely hard to meet every one of these six conditions at once. None of them are mutually exclusive, but meeting all six in one go seems a partially unrealistic aim. Another problem is this. An individual can have obviously and apparently poor mental health and still meet each of these conditions or at least several of them. If we take an example, a violent offender obviously has poor mental health. That's why they're a violent offender, but they might be resistant to stress. They've made their own decisions and they may well have a positive self-image. So these conditions are not concrete and there are caveats. As we've already seen and discussed to an extent, what is considered normal and healthy varies massively. It varies between different time periods and between different countries and their cultures. If we take an example, cohabitation before marriage, that's living together before you're married, is considered entirely normal and acceptable behaviour today in the UK. It conforms to social norms and wouldn't in any way be considered to be abnormal. If we go back a couple of centuries to the 19th century, this behaviour of living together before you're married would have been considered highly degenerate and abnormal. By this we can infer that the definition of what is normal and the social norms that go with that have changed over time. Let's take another example. In the UK today, homosexuality is considered completely and entirely normal. It's accepted by most people in society. And that acceptance, if not the homosexuality itself, is a social norm. To be intolerant of homosexuality in the UK today would place you outside of those social norms, and extreme intolerance might mark you as being mentally ill. However, in several countries, to take examples, Saudi Arabia and Ghana, homosexuality is considered to be very abnormal. Quite often there, being a homosexual or admitting to having an admiration for homosexuality or even just accepting that lifestyle is classed as mental illness. That definition of abnormality and what constitutes abnormality has varied between those cultures. Definitions of normality also vary by age. By that we mean they vary by the age of the person that you're looking at. For example, it's considered entirely normal for babies and infants and children to behave unpredictably. It's part of being a child, behaving unpredictably and irrationally. This will be considered abnormal for adults. One of the major differences between physical and mental illness is that physical illness has a very set and observable list of symptoms. It's easy to tell if somebody has, for example, a broken leg. Mental illness can be hard to define and it can be hard to see as well. It isn't usually visible from the outside, although its consequences usually are. To aid with this, therefore, the UK government, like most governments, provides a very basic list of symptoms. Suffering one or more of this list of symptoms on a chronic, long-term basis rather than acute or short-term basis is classified as being mentally ill. The first of these is impaired intellectual function, such as memory. 
The second is alterations to mood, especially if these lead to delusional appraisals of the world around you, especially if they lead to delusions about past events. Trying to rewrite the past is a sign of mental illness. A third is delusional beliefs. These can include delusions such as extreme envy or extreme persecution of minorities, extreme political views as well that never change. And fourthly, disordered thinking. Being unable to think coherently about the world around you or being unable to communicate coherently with others. Taken together, these four represent a very basic list of symptoms of mental illness. It's not an exclusive list, and an individual doesn't have to be displaying all four to be mentally ill. Any one of them, if sustained over a chronic long-term basis, is enough to meet that definition.